When the murder is left unsolved. Nothing was found to connect him to the murder. With no witnesses, no forensic evidence, no CCTV. And the killer is on the loose. That person has literally got away with murder. One of the most egregious miscarriages of justice in this country. Britain's cold case detectives will never give up. We still have to find the killer. You wake up thinking about the murder, you go to bed thinking about the murder. You want him to catch this person for the family. No matter how long it takes. 20, 30, 40, 50 years, it still matters. They'll investigate every angle. You have to look at the evidence. And uncover every clue. The golden key was, we got the killer's DNA. Until the killer is caught at last. It had taken 32 years for justice to be finally done. You cannot get away with murder. I I've just come down to my house. Um, my mother has a cottage a hundred yards away. Right. Um, I've got no reply from her. I've come in through her bedroom window, which was was unlocked. She's lying on the floor in the kitchen, and it looks to me as if she's been hit. She's been she's been hit over the head. She looks as if she's dead. So at six o'clock in the evening, I was at home making dinner for the kids and the phone rang and I could see straight away it was a blocked number and sure enough, it was the control room. They said, we've got a sudden death in Brambridge. We've received a, a 999 call from a son who said that he had just got home and found his mother lifeless on the floor in the kitchen with a substantial amount of blood around her. It's quite common actually that people will call the police to say that they found a body when in fact they've committed the murder themselves. And a whole host of things are going through your mind as to you know, who is the victim, who is the offender, why has this happened, where is the offender, have they struck somewhere else, are they going to harm someone else? As I go up to the back door of the cottage which leads into the kitchen, I can see that there is a, a female lying on the floor, lifeless, with a big pool of blood around her. It was obvious to me that she was deceased. I had a 77-year-old lady that had been violently assaulted and, and left for dead, and that was Georgina Edmonds. I always take the view that if you're unsure around the circumstances of a death, then you should treat it as a murder until proven otherwise. So this is the main kiln lane, so there's only one way in and one way out. When I arrived, there was still traffic, like there is now, still coming through, trying to weave through the police cars. So I wasn't best pleased about that, um, and so I asked the sergeant just to close the road at both ends. And obviously, I didn't know which route the offender had taken by then, and they may well have walked up here, and they may well have discarded some some um, evidence which I didn't really want damaged by passing traffic. Um, so, yeah, it was uh, probably a little bit inconvenient for some of the locals, but unfortunately, these are some of the things you have to do when you're dealing with such a serious incident. There was a barriers there with police there, so we knew something quite substantial had gone on at somewhere down Kiln Lane. At first, we thought it would be probably like a, you know, a serious road crash. That's the only thing that would have, you know, like closed the road like that. Back in January in 2008, it was blowing a hoolie, you know, it was cold, it was wet, it was windy. Uh, today is completely different. And then behind me, where those big dark gates are now, was actually some white wooden gates and that's the entrance to Fig Tree Cottage. At the time, I was kind of stereotypically thinking domestic homicide, you know, the sort of thing that happens, you know, where son's a bit of a tear away, has a row with mum for whatever reason, I don't know, wanted drugs, robbed his mum, hit her, killed her. 
And then as soon as I step up the drive and I look at the surroundings, I immediately think, this isn't that scenario. This was a large estate. This has got huge grounds. There is money involved in this family. You know, was that a motive? Georgina lived alone in Fig Tree Cottage, close to her son Harry and his family, who live in the main house on the estate. The location itself was remote. Somebody had the confidence to walk up that drive and go into that address and confront this, this lady. Georgina was the nicest person that you could have ever met. Um, everybody's perfect granny. She used to come regularly into the shop, and then at times my father used to do delivery. Dad would have spent time with Georgina, probably had a cup of tea with her, and just chat about the good old days together. She would have trusted everyone, and because she knew everyone. It's a village, why would she not trust anyone? The estate is owned and managed by the Edmonds family, who are in the coffee trading business. Paul is keen to talk to the son, Harry. I've got to keep an open mind that what this person is telling us is the truth. This person's going to be traumatised, particularly if it's his mother. But in the back of my mind, I'm always thinking, this could be suspicious. When I walked up the drive and I looked at what we were dealing with here, and I met Harry, the son, and I realised, not that I could rule him out straight away, but I realised this was slightly different from what I was thinking on my way to the crime scene. He said that he'd been at work up in London, and he thought he'd check in on his mum, as he would normally do on the way home to say hello. But he noticed that the cottage was in darkness, and he thought that was strange. The only person who was known to have seen Georgina that day is her hairdresser. She came round to the house at about 11 o'clock in the morning and did her hair. Nothing was untoward. She had a chat with her. She paid her. The hairdresser left. And as far as we're concerned, that was the last known sighting of Georgina alive on that day. Georgina had significant head injuries. She also had what appeared to be stab wounds around her torso. She had undergone, you know, a really brutal attack. And strangely, there was some money left on the kitchen top, two £10 notes. Well, if this was a robbery or a burglary, why hasn't the offender taken that money? Did they miss that, or were they after something else? It is confirmed that Harry Edmonds has been at work all day before leaving to spend the weekend in Brambridge. The police are satisfied that Harry and his family are innocent victims of a tragic crime. As the forensic team seals off the crime scene, Paul receives a phone call from one of his investigating officers. Somebody had tried to use Georgina's ATM card at a local petrol station. We dispatched officers straight to the scene, and they called me and say, boss, good news, we've got CCTV. If we've got an image on CCTV, it has to be the killer. Seventy-seven-year-old Georgina Edmonds has been found murdered in her home in Brambridge. Only hours after her death, Detective Superintendent Paul Barton receives information that someone has tried to use her bank card at a local ATM. What we had was a, a male who was wearing a large fluorescent jacket with the hood up. And so for me, that indicated that this was somebody who knew that area, knew that camera was there. They were deliberately trying to disguise themselves so that they wouldn't get caught on CCTV. We could say it was a man. We could give a rough build and, and size. Age-wise, we were estimating between sort of 16 and 60, really. As Paul and the team begin the hunt for the man in the fluorescent jacket, the media descend on Brambridge. Straight away, just because of the, you know, 77-year-old lady um, in a lovely house nestling by the, by the River Itch, and, you know, it's not the usual place where, where murders take place. So, no, no, no one was surprised when, uh, 
um, you know, pretty much every news organisation in the country uh, was covering it. The village of Brambridge was sealed off while detectives scoured the area for clues. The 77-year-old woman was found dead in her home yesterday evening. It was devastating. We've not had anything in the village before. It is quite a shock. A whole team of reporters was working over the weekend. People at the scene, people gathering background, people getting reaction. The Hampshire police, they're, you know, they're pretty professional. It's a shame in a way, because, you, you know, as a reporter, you love to get leaks and, and hear stuff, but uh, I don't recall that happening in this case. The way that her life was ended, we were totally shocked because that sort of thing just doesn't happen in this very quiet, friendly neighborhood. As the local community come to terms with the tragic news, a team of forensic investigators are on site processing the crime scene and surrounding area. When you walk in and you see something like a murder of, of an elderly lady in that situation, and you see the injuries that she had sustained, then you're, you're really kind of hit by the, the brutality of it. My name is Dr. Shaham Das. I'm a consultant forensic psychiatrist. So I assess and rehabilitate mentally disordered offenders, usually in prisons or in courts or in secure psychiatric units. When we consider the level of violence in this particular act, it was so extreme. To me, it suggests that it probably wasn't the first time that the perpetrator had committed such acts. I think it's more likely that it had been an escalation over time. So the person probably had some kind of criminal record, possibly with violent offences or domestic violence. Another striking aspect of this case to me is that there was no evidence of forced entry. So to me, that suggests that the victim must have known the killer. So on the one hand, the perpetrator took some items, like the victim's purse and handbag and mobile phone, yet he also left cash lying on the table at the scene. So you have to wonder why that is. Was he disturbed? Uh, was he completely overrun with emotions at the time? Or was he perhaps intoxicated or confused? But it does seem in some way a bit of a botched robbery. We will always start with DNA. So we'll use swabs, swabbing anywhere that there might be blood somewhere that you think that it's possible that the offender might have touched. And another thing that we would do is what's called tapings, pieces of clear tape, and we place them in zoned areas onto a surface, and then we stick them onto sort of plastic sheets, and then we put those, secure those in evidence bags. Georgina was wearing a blouse. She was also wearing a pair of trousers, and there was every possibility that uh, the offender had come into contact with them. So all of those clothes were taped and that evidence was secured. On the floor um, was a marble um, bodied rolling pin. And this particular rolling pin had blood on it and was broken from the very outset. Um, it, it appeared clear that, that this marble rolling pin, which did in fact come from Georgina's kitchen and did belong to Georgina, was the murder weapon. It was clear that she had severe head injuries, which we believe was caused by the rolling pin, but she also had multiple stab wounds on her torso. There were a number of almost sort of pinprick wounds just around her kind of left shoulder area. Was she being tortured to try and get her pin number out of her? She was 77 years old. No one needed to use that level of violence against her, you know. And in fact, if you asked Georgina for some money, she probably would have just given you some money. This was something so unusual. And the headline in the Echo was, you know, killer on the loose. And that's exactly what the situation was. Nobody knew the circumstances, nobody knew the motive, nobody knew why this person had done it. 
And so the fear was, well, if it's happened once, it could happen again. I think the police had a job because there wasn't a lot they could go on initially for them to pick up with what they actually needed to do. There's a lot of shock within the village, and they have to be very careful what they actually do tell the village and, and the community. They need to tell the village enough so they can start to gather information as to what has happened, but they don't actually want to frighten people at the same time. There's a lot of old people that are very, very scared all the time, um, and this is obviously just a great shock. I'm hoping that somebody out there will know some information. In particular, I feel that the person responsible may have confessed this to one of their friends or a relative. Less than a mile from Georgina's cottage is an ex-offenders hostel called Elderfield House. It used to be a good thing, helping prisoners back into society, but now it just seems like it's a complete, you know, nightmare. They've never been tagged, and there's never been a curfew on any of them. They just come and go as they please. It was only months ago that they actually put CCTV in there. It's a, a location whereby people would be released from prison back into the community and try to be rehabilitated. But, you know, it ranged from people with minor theft convictions right up to people with murder convictions. And so to have this location right in the middle of a very affluent village of Otterbourne was quite unnerving for the neighbours. And I could sense that the community would probably be pointing their finger at that location. The public assumed it would have been someone from Elderfield, and so did the press and everyone else, because I can remember a press, a very strong press presence outside of Elderfield with their big lenses looking in. The fact that only three years before, a resident at Elderfield had killed someone in a particularly brutal way was weighing on everyone's mind in the village. At approximately 7.40 hours this morning, four men aged 21, 28, 36 and 37 years of age were arrested by Hampshire detectives on suspicion of the murder of Georgina Elizabeth Edmonds. I just think the police were doing their job targeting Elderfield to start with because they thought that was a likely place and, and, and probably why wouldn't they? Three of the arrested men have solid alibis. But one of them was of particular interest. Not only did he have previous convictions for murder or manslaughter, but he also possessed a fluorescent jacket. Despite previous convictions, this suspect also has an alibi. We thought we'd had a major breakthrough. We were satisfied that he wasn't involved, but we were back to square one again, where we just didn't have a clue who was responsible for Georgina's death. In the laboratory we used to examine all of our DNA and other forensic evidence did find a partial DNA profile that didn't belong to Georgina and that was found on one of the handles of the rolling pin. Extracting and identifying a DNA profile when it's mixed with the victim's DNA is extremely difficult. But it was a breakthrough in that we certainly had a partial DNA profile that we could then work with. And so what we did was load that onto the DNA database. But unfortunately, that came back with nothing. Now, there's two reasons for that, potentially. One is that the offender isn't on the DNA database. Or well, the second reason is that the profile that we've submitted isn't of sufficient value to actually yield a result from the National DNA database. Generally, police officers and the public kind of expect us to catch the killer within 24, 48 hours. And nine times out of 10, that happens. But when it doesn't happen, you then start moving into almost an unknown territory where you start thinking, hang on a minute, this isn't normal. You know, are we actually never gonna catch this person who's responsible for this brutal killing?
One month into the investigation, a mobile phone is found on the riverbank close to Fig Tree Cottage. We go straight to the scene, and we find out that it's Georgina's phone. The offender decided to discard it, and instead of throwing it in the river, he actually overthrew it, and it landed on the other bank, which was great for us because we were able to locate it. The battery had actually been removed we could establish that it had actually been turned off at 3.18 that afternoon from the network by the murderer. We could then look at the movement of that phone by looking at cell site analysis, where your phone would bounce off various masts. We could now visualise the route that the offender had taken. It was showing me a clear line of direction following the river along the towpath from Georgina's cottage all the way down into Twyford Road, Eastleigh, which is where the ATM machine was used. With the discovery of Georgina's phone, Paul now knows that the killer struck between 11 a.m. when Georgina's hairdresser left and 3.18 in the afternoon. We were following up all sorts of leads, but time was flying by. Whilst you don't want to think about failure, as the case gets colder and colder, you start thinking, what if this is the killer that's got away? What we didn't have was that lucky break. We didn't have a name in the system as to who was responsible. We arrested quite a few people, um, but those alibis all checked out. It just felt that we weren't getting anywhere. We were conducting house to house in the area, knocking on doors and speaking to all of the occupants establishing where they were on the night of the murder. One address of note came up in Twyford Road, which is where the ATM machine was. We were informed that a man had been living there right up to the day of Georgina's murder, and then it just disappeared without notice. The individual was actually a Polish national. He did live at that address, but he fled the country and then went back to Poland. We sent a team out to Poland, and they were briefed to go and trace this individual. The Polish National Police identified this person and helped us to get hold of him and have a conversation with him. We'd obviously had his permission to take his DNA and his fingerprints, so we needed to process that as well. It was a, a tense waiting game. Having hit several dead ends, Paul and his team are hopeful that a Polish man is their killer and can be matched to their partial DNA sample found on the murder weapon. We thought we'd had a major breakthrough with the Polish national. Throughout the interview, he gave an account why he fled. He just decided to up sticks and leave. It just happened to be a coincidence that it was on the day that Georgina's body was found. The Polish man's DNA is not a match for the partial profile, and he has a solid alibi. Unfortunately, there was a lot of media around um, us going to Poland, and rightly so, I guess. But I think a lot of the community at that point then switched off and felt that the person responsible was this Polish national, and therefore we caught this individual, and that's the end of the investigation. But that wasn't the end of the investigation. People were frustrated and I think they were anxious as well. I mean, people definitely anxious because they didn't know if there was someone still at loose that was capable of doing another crime similarly to that because they had no idea the motive or what was behind what originally happened. Paul still believes that the key to identifying Georgina's killer lies in finding a DNA match to their partial profile. The decision was taken to do a mass screening DNA process, focusing on all those men that lived in that area and asking them to come forward and give up their DNA. I remember thinking at the time that you're hardly likely to volunteer if you've done it. I think if you think about it for five seconds, it, I don't think they were going to catch the killer by asking people to voluntarily come forward. 
But what we did get was we got some really good intelligence. Having taken over 2,000 samples from local men in the area for their DNA, we were still drawing blanks. We still weren't getting the hit that we wanted. But at the same time, we were appealing for information. We wanted witnesses to come forward. We wanted people to name who they thought might be responsible. And someone in the community came forward and gave us Matthew Hamlin's name. Thirty-year-old local man Matthew Hamlin lives near the ATM on Twyford Road and has a criminal record for violence and drug use. There was no previous convictions of, you know, being caught in possession of an offensive weapon, like a knife or something. So for me, I was a bit concerned as how he's gone from sort of low-level drug user, bit of a sort of a fighter, up to this scale of, you know, horrendous brutal murderer. Hamlin was from sort of the, the, the working class sort of end of Eastleigh, for want of a better phrase. And he'd been an electrician, trained electrician, you know, and you can't hold down a trade like that by being, you know, the archetypal sort of druggie. So clearly, you know, he was somebody who was able to just about manage. What we found out by speaking to the girlfriend was that he'd had a violent argument with her the day before Georgina's murder and actually had assaulted her with a, an ironing board. When we look at the profile of Hamlin, we know that he has committed fairly serious previous domestic violence. We know that he's an alcohol and drug user and we know that he's desperate for money. So he absolutely fits the profile of somebody that might commit such an extreme violent act like murder. To date, Paul and his team have only had a partial DNA profile. Now he has a named suspect with previous convictions whose DNA will be on record. Then all of that work that it hasn't been possible to do for the last two years, we could then do. And a partial profile can't be loaded to the DNA database. It can only be examined by way of comparing it directly to a suspect. Once we did all the comparison work, we discovered that there was a partial match. This partial DNA from the rolling pin came back to Matthew Hamlin. Cell site analysis also places Matthew Hamlin's phone close to Fig Tree Cottage and on the riverbank where Georgina's phone was found. On the 30th of June, 2010, uh, Matthew Hamlin was arrested on suspicion of Georgina's murder. And he was brought into custody and he was processed. An Eastley man had been arrested and, and your first thing was slight surprise that, because uh, it was so long afterwards, it had seen that the, you know, the trail had gone cold. We were very surprised it was a local man. You wouldn't think anyone in the village could ever be capable of doing anything like that. But we were pleased that the police possibly had someone in the frame for this murder. It started to put people's minds perhaps slightly at rest, and we just hoped they had the evidence to follow it through. To my surprise, he actually spoke during interview, because normally in a situation like that, the advice given to a suspect by the solicitor is to go no comment. He effectively said, he can't really remember what he was doing, which was which was no surprise. But obviously, if you committed a murder, you think, well, you're going to remember that. But um, he, he gave nothing away. He made no omissions. He claimed he could not remember anything that had happened and what he'd done. And that's not too unusual for people in his situation. He might have found the whole process traumatic and intoxication both can separately lead to memory lapses. Having said all that, in my opinion, it's very likely that he would have had some snippets of memory or some vague memories. I think it's very unlikely that he completely had forgotten the entire episode. Because he was kept in custody for a, a number of days, we allowed him to have a visit at the police station by his mother. Authority was given to covertly record that. The other thing is I might have an alibi for it as well. What do you mean? When I first interviewed me, I had um, 
I ain't got a clue where I was. And she got out of her diary and she flipped through, looked at the date, and she said, um, yeah, you was with me. I can't speak. Yeah. See so if she's still going to make that. We had some very interesting conversations that came out of that, which would suggest that Hamlin was asking his mum to come up with an alibi for him. While Paul and his team build their case, Hamlin is released on police bail. We've got Matthew Hamlin, who lived in the area at the time of the murder. We've got his previous convictions for violence, and we even know on the day before the murder, he had assaulted his girlfriend. We know also at that time, he was heavily into crack cocaine, and was quite often high on drugs. He knows the footpath, and in fact, his mobile phone data was telling us that he was also in that area at that particular time. On top of that, he had nine component parts of his DNA that matched that partial DNA from the rolling pin. He was an extremely strong suspect. We had sufficient evidence, we felt, to go to the Crown Prosecution Service. The CPS have enough evidence to charge Matthew Hamlin with the murder of Georgina Edmonds. On the 14th of November 2011, Hamlin appears at Winchester Crown Court. He pleads not guilty. It's a big day. It's something that we've all been waiting for since January 2008. Georgina is not here anymore. We are her voice, and we are here to get justice for her and for her family. You looked at Matthew Hamlin, and he just looked like, you know, the sort of bloke you'd sit next to at the football or stand next to at the bar. There wasn't anything out of the ordinary about him, you know, the, the banality of evil, as uh, somebody once said. We're confident as a prosecution team that we've got the right person, and we sit through that trial listening to the evidence. Some of it is very complex, and so you're trying to deliver that in a way that the jury can understand, um, but it's not easy. The DNA evidence that was presented to the jury was these nine markers of DNA that we found on the handle of the rolling pin which matched Matthew Hamlin. When you put it together with the cell site analysis and you show them where his phone was on the day of the murder, at the times that she was murdered, it paints a very, very compelling picture. Eight weeks is a long time for a trial, particularly a murder trial with only one defendant. I remember being surprised that it was lasting so long. All parties are called back into the, the well of the court. Your heart is pounding, really sort of charged atmosphere. They ask the foreman of the jury if they've reached a verdict which they all agree upon, and they say they have. And then they put it to them, you know, do you find the defendant, Matthew Hamlin, guilty or not guilty, the murder of Georgina Edmonds? And they said not guilty. I just couldn't believe it. And none of my colleagues could believe it as well. And there was, you know, gasps in the public gallery from both sides. I'm just thinking about Georgina and her family, and, and what did we do wrong? You know, how, how did it come to this, really? The jury is 12 men and women picked at random, and maybe if they'd picked a jury the following day, you'd have got a completely different decision. Who knows? When Matthew was acquitted, we were all very, very surprised about that. There was also then a lot of uncertainty w within the village. There were a, a lot of people who thought, hmm, well, he's been acquitted, he's innocent, then someone else is guilty, therefore the killer could still be out there. I was convinced it was the wrong decision. I was convinced that he was responsible, but I had to accept the jury's decision on that. You're just thinking, that person has literally got away with murder and there's nothing I can do about it. Matthew Hamlin is a free man. 
For Paul and the entire Hampshire police force, it is a devastating blow. My children were really young at the time. Yeah, and it's like, Daddy, have you caught Georgina Edmonds' killer yet? And it's like, not yet, you know, but we're working on it, you know. I knew Matthew Hamlin was responsible for Georgina Edmonds' murder, and I'm not going to give up. This wasn't about Matthew Hamlin not being guilty. This was about the jury feeling there was not enough evidence to find Matthew Hamlin guilty. After the trial has finished, Hamlin completely changed his lifestyle. He cleaned up his act. He cut down the drinking and the drug use. He became far more responsible as an adult. And you have to wonder why this is. Clearly, he had some kind of internal epiphany. It could have been related to the fact that he felt so guilty about the act that he actually undertaken, or it could just be that he was so relieved that he realized he, he'd flown too close to the sun and just about gotten away with it. Before 2003, a law known as double jeopardy meant he could not be tried for the same crime twice. Then the law changed. There is an option to retry Matthew Hamlin if we can gather new and compelling evidence and convince the court that the acquittal was unsafe. But that is not an easy process, and it's rarely been done in the UK. Having reviewed all their evidence, Paul is left with one final chance to prove his case. There were some skin cell tapings that we've taken from the sleeve of Georgina's blouse that hadn't been sent off. The scientists at the time felt that the tapings were too heavily contaminated by the victim's DNA, and therefore they wouldn't be able to separate any offender's DNA. Technology and DNA analysis have advanced since the forensic evidence was first examined. YSTR is a technique which is able to identify the male chromosome within the DNA profile. Using this technique, they were able to separate the profile and find a male profile from within these skin cells. That's when we got the best news that we had had throughout this whole case, a DNA profile that matched Matthew Hamlin. You need to convince the Court of Appeal, first of all, that the acquittal was wrong and that the evidence we had was new and compelling. Fortunately for us, the Court of Appeal agreed with our decision and they quashed the acquittal and we were given permission to charge Matthew Hamlin and go for a retrial. We heard that, you know, he'd been re-arrested and recharged. Everyone thought, oh, that's interesting. That doesn't happen very often. So I imagine for that whole period of time, he must have been living in absolute fear and terror, possibly even paranoia, about what the police were going to bring to this new trial. And on some level, he must have known there was a, a reasonable chance that he would be found guilty this time around. This time around, I was even more confident but probably even more nervous because you just don't know how these things are going to be played out. This time, the evidence was completely compelling. It, it wasn't just circumstantial evidence. We had a DNA profile that, with a statistic of 26 million to one, that matched Matthew Hamlin. In our previous DNA, I think it was something like 2,000 to one. I'm just hoping the jury are really going to understand those statistics and what that actually means. We felt sure that this DNA evidence, layered on top of all the other evidence that we'd massed, was sufficient to convict. But I got it wrong before, so what did I know, you know? I'm always a bit of a mess, if I'm honest. You know, I, I start getting really nervous, and I remember thinking, three hours, is that, is that good or is that bad? And I, I just didn't know. The jury stood up and they said guilty. <laughs> you know, it was, it was a great feeling. It's been a long time coming, but we finally got there. Mm -hmm. 
So when I step back and look at this entire case, to me, it feels like a man who was in a desperate situation. He was addicted to alcohol and drugs. He was in debt, probably quite disinhibited at the time, wasn't really thinking through the consequences of his actions, who had a, a penchant for previous violence, who did something very extreme, possibly regretted it to a degree afterwards. But then he was relatively lucky initially, at least, in that he managed to almost get away with murder. So I'm sure that would have brought him a massive sense of relief. And he thought that the whole incident was behind him and he could go on and continue living his life. And it seems that he did change his lifestyle to a degree, whether that was related to remorse or guilt or purely for selfish reasons, because he realized he was so close to getting caught and wanted to deflect attention. I don't think we'll ever know. But then further down the line, luckily for us, due to advances in the evidence, he was eventually found guilty and justice was eventually served. I was actually there, um, standing behind, uh, standing behind the cameras. Done four years ago, the Assistant Chief Constable of Hampshire stood here and had the unenviable task of explaining to the assembled media that Matthew Hamlin had been found not guilty of the murder of my mother, Georgina Edmonds. They'd conducted themselves with tremendous dignity and, and grace through what must have been eight years of awfulness. I'm in the very proud and happy position of being able to stand here and thank the Hampshire Constabulary Major Crime Department for finally bringing Matthew Hamlin into justice. There was a feeling of very much of warmth towards them that finally the family had, you know, seen justice. You know, you were, you were desperately pleased for them and sad at the same time that it had taken so long, you know, and, and to have the, you know, the first trial. So I've really done that well. I'm getting so choked up about it. Give me a moment. The village will never, ever forget it. And in some ways, I think it's brought the village closer together. Every time I drive down the road now, um, I always look over to the cottage because I did always love the cottage. And it always brings back the memories, and it always will do. I can imagine Georgina walking across the lawn towards the river like I always remember her doing, or just walking to greet people as they came up to the house. Everyone knew who Georgina was, and she was just a lovely, lovely person. I know it's, it sounds like a stupid thing to say, but he didn't strike me as, as, as a killer. Clearly, he is. And it, is, it just goes to show that, you know, appearances can be deceiving. Georgina Edmonds, she was exactly the same age as my mum. So, yeah, it was one of those, those, those killings that you just don't forget. It's a privilege to be in charge of investigating somebody's murder. It gets quite personal. I think particularly with Georgina, um, you know, 77-year-old grandma, good, fun old lady, had her wits about her and, and was generally a, a, a kind person. Yeah, it, do, it does impact on your life. Living with this investigation for eight years, there's a huge amount of pressure on your shoulders. But I think what this shows is that the police will never give up. I'm proud that we did all we could to get justice for Georgina, and we got the result that we deserved. If you or someone you know has been affected by any of the issues raised in this programme, please go to channel5.com slash helplines for information and support. Next up, the race is on to find a hit-and-run driver who injured an 11-year-old. Police Night Shift 999 is on the way. <laughs>